Hello, and welcome to Impact in the Classroom. If you're new to the podcast, we talk about all the policies, research, and challenges that are impacting early childhood classrooms. I'm your host, Marnetta Larimer. So, what's impacting the classroom? Today, we're talking about funding. But more specifically, we're talking about how funding has not been equitable throughout the early childhood space. Digging into this with me today are Kiami Harris, the Chief Equity and Strategy Officer at the Early Childhood Funders Collaborative, and Dr. William Johnson, the Director of Educational Strategy at the William Casper Braustein, um, Braustein, I'm gonna get it right, Memorial Fund. So let's take this moment um, and introduce yourself to our listeners and tell me a little bit about your organizations. Sure, hi. Thanks for having me. Again, I'm Kiami Harris, and I am with the Early Childhood Funders Collaborative. Joined them um, fairly recently as their very first Chief Equity and Strategy Officer, which is an outgrowth of the work that our steering committee was committed to, and they prioritized racial equity as a learning and practice imperative for ECFC members. And so in 2019, we started the Racial Equity Work Group. And so I say that I am the promise of (laughs) the racial equity work group who is very committed to this work. And so, you know, a lot of my background and what I've done over my career has been in equity before this work was, you know, considered equity work. It has just been the work. And so I'm excited to be here alongside of a colleague of mine who I know you're going to introduce shortly. But and prior to that, I've been in this educational space for a very long time. I think I fell into this work in 1999 and started in the public education system and then have been in the nonprofit space. I'm working on behalf of Black children and families and then all children and families as an outgrowth. So thanks for having me. Welcome. So Dr. William Johnson, I am, as you said, the uh, Director of Educational Strategy at the William Casper Grossman Memorial Fund. But prior to philanthropy, for the past 18 years, I was a school teacher, a school leader, and a district leader. In the last four and a half years, I've served in this role. So I've been serving students in the education space now for 20-something years. And I think something that's really important, I'm a member of the National ECFC, but I'm also the co-chair of Connecticut's Early Childhood Funder Collaborative. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. And again, welcome to the podcast. So excited to talk with both of you. So first question, what are ways in which previous policies or funding has been inequitable in the past? Well, all right, let's jump into it then. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, I'll say the early child care, um, child care or learning industry was for sure built on the backs of Black women, right? Um, Who weren't paid at all to care for white children. And so we know this, right? We know this. I think a lot of people are familiar with that. But I'll say what's been uh, very interesting is the the Early Educator Investment Collaborative and Child Trends commissioned a report in 2021 that focused on literature review and a way to develop policies and, and practices as they map the history of systemic racism in child care and early learning. So it's called the Mary Popper Report, but it had a particular focus on um, educator pay, benefits, preparation, and the workforce stability. And so, you know, throughout history, I'd say racism and sexism have been embedded into, you know, the laws and policies at federal, state, local levels. And these policies have been, in my opinion, used to systemically discriminate against Black women and other women, for sure. And so, you know, you you see that play out with low wages for early child care educators, for sure. You see it play out with, um, you know, lack of health care um, for uh, our workforce, or the early learning workforce, for sure. You see that, um, you know, just And I'll even take it back further, which is outlined in the report that I just referenced that talked about, you know, how way back when, you know, when the federal government enacted policies to abolish slavery, you saw states enact Jim Crow and Black Code laws. So those are like clear examples of the way in which policies has impacted Black and Brown individuals from way back when, 
And so then you think about Head Start, of course, which was right. created by the feds to help ensure that states funded education for, for young children, for Black children specifically also, because they weren't doing that. And so, you know, those are those are things that come up to me. And I think it's important to, to reflect back to history, because it certainly is informing to what is happening and playing out today. And I will, you know, I'll, I'll defer to you, Billy, in case you want to add to that. So I, I think the key thing I would just add is we as a country have never undone old policies. We just built new ones on top of them. Mm-hmm. So to say we're, we're going to get to a place of equitable policy requires you to fix and repair the old, which it seems to me in my 47 years of existence, I haven't seen enough will to do that. Right. Kiami knocked it right out the park. Like this is this is not we have to go back to the root of the issue. Right. Because early childhood, I, I say this and, and this is not opinion. It's just fact. Right. Early childhood was fine when black women were breastfeeding and taking care of specifically their slave owners, children. Right. Mm-hmm. And not being paid. This is not an opinion. Right. I know folks get very sensitive about our history, but you can't come up with equitable policy without addressing the history. Then. Right. As soon as early childhood became right, a public good. Guess who's still at the bottom of the pay scale. Right. You can take a guess. History shows it. So I I, want to just emphasize to move to an equitable place. Kiami outlined all the history. We have to go back. We can't just come up with a new policy. We have to fix and repair the old policy, right? And then create the new policy out of the repair and the fix. And when I'm talking about repairing and fixing, like I'm not just talking about I'm sorry, or I'm not just saying we're eliminating that, right? It takes a resource to change the trajectory of where we're trying to go. So I'll just add that. Wonderful. Uh, You see me incessantly nodding. If you're only hearing this, know that I am incessantly nodding (laughs) as they are speaking. You said that we need to get to the root, right? The root causes. What foundational shifts that we just keep stacking on to do you see specifically that need to happen? Well, I think that, so there's, we, we all, this, this actually, if you've been educated in the USA, right? You have an, a, an indoctrinated belief about X, and you can put whatever it is in X, right? And tr- early childhood could be there, or what is valued could be there, right? Or not valued, right? We need to come to this place of understanding that the way we're educated is indoctrinated to participate in a system that has lasted for hundreds of years in our country, which is capitalism or inequity, right? Capitalism drives inequity. Someone has to be at the top. Well, a small few need to be at the top. The large amount have to be at the bottom to keep the system running in in place, right? So for me, right, I'm not, we, there's a lot of unlearning and relearning we need to do, right? At the same time, I'm not saying stop doing the work because also folks will say, oh, let's stop doing the work and let's relearn and unlearn. No, we have enough white papers and research to tell us what we need to do. But I think that the key root issue is what we value, because if we value our babies, right? And every single baby, right? And the people who are actually there, right? Nurturing our children. We don't need to have too much of a conversation about why are people being paid poverty wages, right? Basically, the real answer to this, we don't value our babies as a system. And I want to say that because I'm not talking about individuals because I think individuals value babies. But we also have to come to this place of understanding, because I hear this a lot, and I don't know, Kiami, where you stand on this. We always talk about the system as if we all aren't a part of it. Right. Right. The system, like, so when I say the system, I'm talking about me, you, and every other American who lives here, right? If we say we value our babies and the opportunities we want them to have, then we have to be active participants and unlearning and pressuring wherever we sit, right? I sit in education, so there in philanthropy, that's where my efforts will lie. I'm not sure we move to the inequitable place until we understand, like, the root thing is us. Yes, it's old policy, 
but it's us who allows the old policy to be maintained and not just marginalized people, all people. I want to just like snap my fingers and say, yes, yes, Billy. Well, because this is what I've been saying for so many years and I've been doing this equity work for a while and more more recently doing it with um, those who are in seats of power and sharing with them that, you know, we talk about the system is this, the system is that as if, as you said, as if it's somewhere far off, like if it's some group of people who sit at the top of the mountain somewhere, whereas we are all a part of the system. We are the change that we want to see. We have to cede power to those who don't have it. And that is whether you are a white woman, a black woman, um, you know, another person of color, if you hold a seat of power, you need to be grabbing somebody along and ceding some of that power and listening and hearing, because that is the only way that I really think that we're truly going to be able to get to change. Because a lot of us are not proximate to the challenges that are happening. We have, many of us have not been on the ground or know what's happening, haven't been there in a long, long time, particularly those who are in spaces who, who are able to provide resources, um, who are making policies, they haven't been there and they don't know what the real issues are. And so I, I find it always challenging for those who are in seats of power, who are making decisions for those in, in our most vulnerable communities, but who have our most valuable children living in them, mm-hmm. don't really understand the issues. Absolutely. So in your current positions, I'm just going to piggyback on what you're saying. Have there been any personal experiences, right, in your journey as a teacher or as you've moved into the position that you're in that has influenced heavily the work that you're doing now? I will say all of the experiences. So I come from, I've worked in, started my career in the Prince George's County public school system, which is considered to be one of the richest Black counties in the USA. However, it has great disparity. And I've always worked in Title I schools when I was an educator. And so those experiences working with students who are, as I always say, are most valuable and not most vulnerable, to me, shaped who I am today because they lived in communities and were in schools that were not well resourced. Um, And then when they did get schools that were resourced, they had other barriers, other things that were around them, crime, hunger, so many other issues where there weren't those wraparound supports. And there's only so much that the school could provide. And so I'm I I always felt like, what else could we be doing? What else could we be doing to support these communities in addition to educating them in the public school system? And so that is part and parcel why I wanted to be into this nonprofit space, because I felt like there would be more, there was so much more that I could do from a, 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 not just my, my smaller community, but also nationally. And so I went to work at the National Black Child Development Institute, which works unapologetically on behalf of Black children and families. And so, and that is where I feel like, you know, communities and organizations who are most proximate to these communities are having and seeing real success because they are the ear to the ground and they are able to to react immediately to the needs of these communities. And even being at the national level, I still felt like there's so much more I can learn, so much more I can do. And so I think this step of moving into what I call philanthropy adjacent, because my our organization is a membership organization for philanthropy, but being able to be in conversation with those in community, but also those who have the resources to impact community has been, for me, I feel life changing. And I think is really going to be able to move us, move communities and move the needle in, in early learning so, in such a significant way. I, I feel such hope. <laughs> <laughs> that that's going to happen. Marlena, can you repeat that question? Because I listen to Cami and I'm just, it's okay. I'm thinking I of things. Can. If I can remember what I said. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I said in your current position, have there been mm-hmm. any of your own personal experiences that have influenced the work that you're, you know, doing? Oh, yes. Talk- so talk to me about that. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I think offering this information would be helpful. So, I'm second gen college goer. So my mom was first, right? And I think in our communities, 
I don't think, I just know in our community, the education has heavily pushed. My family came from the South to the North for jobs. My great grandmother, my grandmother, I think my mom was like six. And my mom did everything she was supposed to do, right? And she went to college, she became a teacher and had a life of working poverty, right? Like, you know, this is, and I, I give this experience because sometimes we believe there are there is data to support, right? Young children experience the world different when their their parents are college educated. There's data to support that. But when you introduce the intersection of race and gender, right, that doesn't necessarily add up the way you would think it would. And I, I offer that because I go, having a college educated mother who was a teacher, right, who actually knew her best way professionally to navigate the education system for her Black son, right, still did not land me in any position of privilege or readiness, right? And I'll say that because when I got to college, although I took AP courses and the things they say you should take to be college ready, I figured out pretty quickly at my high school graduation that they were everyone who got a diploma that day, we all, our diplomas all meant different things. <laughs> so I offer that personal experience around this because, yes, it shows up in my work. And it's actually the thing that drove me to become a teacher. I did not want to become a teacher because my mom was, because I saw we still lived in poverty. Right. <laughs> that wasn't my interest, right? Mm -hmm. But when I got to school and I realized, like, I had did everything, my mom's a teacher, and they're still saying I'm not ready to be here right? Not intellectually, but skills, right? It was about the skill part. That continues to drive me. One other thing that I will say that has been a conscious choice, because when I talk about resources in our community, I'm actually talking about human resources also, right? I think this thing that we're fed, right, in the American education system, specifically if you're Black or Brown, right, is Get a good education so you can move as far away from your community as possible. So mm -hmm. I am not community adjacent. I live the same place that I live, right? I'm very clear that I have access to resources and power that other people in my community simply don't. But what good is that doing them if I'm not there, okay. right? I think, you know, all my personal experience, so when we talk about it as a foundation with other foundations. I'm not talking about it from um, what I used to remember, mm -hmm. right? Because during the pandemic, I was a resource to my family mm -hmm. because I have, I am adjacent to resources, right? So when a cousin calls and their fridge is empty and they're working 80 hours a week trying to figure out childcare because childcare system literally shut down in our communities, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is not for me a adjacent thing. It's just a, a daily living thing. And I have a strong, strong belief, you know, we're never going to change our most destitute communities from the outside in. It's from the inside out. And I think it leads to kind of where we put our resources, mm -hmm. right? Because we, we have a history of um, leaving our, our resources. I'll say philanthropy has a history. Mine is only five years in. But I know this to be true, even in the education system. When resources come in, we leave it to middle management to decide where it's going to go. And to Kiami's point, middle management has never lived in the community, although they, quote unquote, worked in the community for 30 years. So they don't understand actually how the resources need to be used. And what we know is systemically, resources are used in a very specific way that are inequitable. So we have to be thoughtful about how we leverage our resources, human resources and monetary resources to actually promote change. And I think um, for me, it's staying in proximity, right? I may not be in proximity to my community forever, but whatever, wherever I go, I'm going to be very much in proximity to the community that reflects my community because I understand the closer I am to that community, the better I will understand how to wield power right? Mm -hmm. To have that impact. I love that. It's much more than just visiting. Yeah, you've been there 30 years, but you go home back to a different space, right? You don't have that Absolutely. experience. You don't know how, you know, yes, you provided this resource, but it was not enough or was not the correct resource, right? It's not a lived experience for you because you're just visiting. You just have a ticket, right? To Absolutely. get it back out. 
Thank you for that. Oh, such a great conversation. So how can funders and policymakers ensure that their dollars are used in a just and equitable way? I'll jump in, Gabby, because for me, I go, your dollars need to go directly to parents. So let me let me explain. It, it goes back to the last point I made about if you, if we, so I'll use a real example. Everyone's hopes around Build Back, right? I'm going to give an example because if, in my opinion, this is an opinion, but if you really think about how our system works, <laughs> it's not an opinion. If Build Back dollars came from the feds, which honestly, I was even hopeful that would happen, right? But if it lands at the state and institutional level, how many of the dollars are actually going to hit the children we're talking about, right? We have a system that already tells us who's in need. We already have that system. Like the, the system already exists. For me, in order for that to happen, dollars actually have to hit parents and children. We know what children are born. We know where they are. We know how much their parents make or don't make. Like dollars need to hit them and parents should have the power of choice on where they want to send their children. I think this is a very important as a parent of a three-year-old during the pandemic who stayed home. I, I want to give this example because I think not only should dollars go to parents, but here's why. During the pandemic, we're very old school in my community as far as the network, right? So I call, call my mom, call my boy, and my mom calling all her church friends seeing like, who is still keeping kids during this time, right? Because those are networks, whether it's church, if you belong to some other, you know, organization. And my mom's like, yeah, Billy, everybody that used to do that during the pandemic, of course, they're in the 70s. They're like, they're just closed down, right? Now, you're talking about a person who has resources. What I value most about, right, early child care is that my child can be with someone who values them and who they are the way I do, right? But if you set up systems that only allow people to access public dollars to go to centers, and I said not a pick on centers, but centers mean something very specific in Connecticut. I, I won't speak for the rest of the United States. You do not have a whole lot of centers that are run by people of color. You don't. Right. So for me, you know, when I think of those dollars, the way you deal with it is dollars need, should go directly to parents so they have choice to send their children where they value. Right. Instead of the trickle, you know, trickle, trickle down anomics and whatever that it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. So I'm oversimplifying it, but I don't think I am because we have a system that says this person makes this amount of money. This person does. And we could literally, literally. On a very simple basis, right, parent, you have two children under this age, X amount of dollars will be allocated to you based on the percentage of money that you make, and you can make the choice on where you want care to happen. I mean, that's just my opinion and my thought about it. I think it's a lovely thought. <laughs> it is an amazing, it is an amazing thought. And I think some of it, some of that was in Build Back Better, but I don't think that it was talked about enough. Um, and I feel like when you think about ways for them to know is to certainly do just that. And like a lot of my work previously has been with family and community engagement. And I think it goes back to who is proximate. Families and communities know what they need. They know exactly what they need. They know how to use the resources that are given to them, but people don't ask them and people don't include them in the decision-making process from the beginning. And I think that is a challenge that I always see that there are people out here who think they know best what families and communities need. And they never mm -hmm. once take the time to ask. And so mm -hmm. I think it's just, if 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 you did that, if you fund it, um, in addition to funding the national advocates, but you fund these grassroots organizers and advocates to be able to do their work, you would get mm -hmm. better results and, and really understand um, what's going on. Because to Billy's point, we have all the data. We already have the information that we need. We don't need any more white papers. We don't necessarily need to commission a bunch of studies to tell us where the funding should go. We need to 
inf- infuse this funding into places where we know people mm. need it most. You saw when we gave folks the, that the money, um, the COVID relief dollars, it instantly supported, it instantly helped and changed the lives of people. Instantly. Mm-hmm. I mean, if people want to, to spend these narratives of how people use the money in, in negative ways, but to be quite honest, I still, to Billy's point, I still live in the community that I was born and raised in. I still live in Prince George's County. I was born here. I worked here. I went to school here and I still live here every day. And I was able to see how transformational those dollars were for the people in the communities that I live in and that are around here. Mm-hmm. And so I say to that point, the way in which policymakers can ensure that those dollars and funders are used in just and equitable, equitable ways is to think about is to, to challenge their own them, their own thoughts and biases about communities of color and the why mm-hmm. why they won't just infuse those dollars directly to why there has to be a middle person to make these mm-hmm. things happen. Do you have any, um, you know, as people are listening to this, what are your suggestions to help to elevate those voices, right? Elevate those families, right? Those communities to where they can get what they mm-hmm. need. On the funders, I would say I'm really excited about some of our own members at, at ECSD and the ways in which they are shifting how they fund and who they fund. Certainly, there have been years and decades and decades where funders have not considered voices in communities, but it's really encouraging to me in the short time that I've been um, in my role to see the commitment by uh, philanthropy and centering those voices um, of communities of color, of grassroots organizers, and really being able to listen to them and fund them in ways that they had not been funding them previously. And I mean, communities that are Black-led or Native-led, funding them with capacity building dollars and not imposing their own ideas of what should be done in those communities. So so I'm encouraged by some of that um, and hopeful that it won't just be for the now, that it will continue. Mm-hmm. And that is that has been like, I think transformational because again, I've been in early learning and in nonprofit spaces for years and, and know that there has been a lot of mission creep and, and people mm-hmm. um, changing what they do because they need dollars, they need money to support. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited Mm -hmm. to see multi-year funding and funding that are in conversations that are being had in conjunction with communities of color. No, I I agree. I think my challenge to everyone is, why do we feel, and, and, and I'm saying this openly from a broader context, that in order to deal with ills of the world that we know exist, we have to lift somebody's voice. And part of me, when I say that, and I'm being very clear about this, has more to do with the part of rejecting the history we know exists or finding a way to talk about it differently instead of just talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I want to be clear, I am not undermining the question. I know the importance of lifting Mm -hmm. the right voices, but Mm -hmm. I want to just, I'm speaking to like lawmakers and policymakers on First, a part of me goes like, is a requirement for you to be a lawmaker and policymaker to understand the history of this country? (laughs) And and, and listen, I'm a teacher. There's requirements. I had to take a whole lot of tests. Right. Mm -hmm. And I and I say that not in a way to to diminish people's hard work. What I say is what I would hope is our lawmakers and policymakers, especially um, in my living time on Earth, what I've been through or seen visibly that everybody else has seen over the last three years, that I'd be saying, listen, maybe I don't know something and I need to know the history of where this stuff comes from so I can help drive policy that is more meaningful for all people. And like I said, I'm not saying that to undermine the lifting of voices, Mm -hmm. but I'm getting at a really, really key issue in our country about decision makers right? Decision makers listen to who they listen to for very specific reasons. Whether it's a voting contingency, these are the people who keep me in my seat, right? Or on their own basic understanding of our country and our history. 
You make decisions on that or your own personal experience. Um, I want to lift that other aspect of learnings, understanding, right? Because the thing that I think is easy for people to do, right? Number one is listen to the people who put them in seats Mm -hmm. or jump on the trend of whatever is popular, right? You know, just kind of putting that other perspective, because I, I completely agree with the lifting of the voices because marginalized communities don't have seats at those tables. But what I've seen is even when they get seated, seats at those tables, right, the people at the tables, they don't have enough historical or contextual understanding of the world to see like sometimes they go like, what are these people talking about? Right. And that's not the intent. Right. Our intent is to lift the story so you have a better understanding. But I go, listen, if I'm 60 years old and I've understood the word from the world from the very narrow perspective of my community that is not that community, I'm looking at these folks who and I'm air quote these folks who are getting their voices lifted and coming to the table as not the reality of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. I just think there needs to be a lot more intentional conversations at the decision-making level also. So Mm -hmm. folks aren't just making decisions in rooms isolated from the rest of the world or their constituents. That leads us perfectly into my next question, right? Because they have the same data, the white papers, the research, right? So Mm -hmm. how can providers and leaders at the local, state, and federal level all hold each other accountable for this work? that we know needs to happen. Well, I go back to my my original thing. Stop putting funds into the traditional system and expecting something different to happen. Right? Like the funds to me, this is early child care in the sense of a parent's power of what they want is is probably the easiest thing in my opinion to invest in. Because if funds come to me and this notion, and Kiami, you named it earlier, like this notion that people don't know what to do with money, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where's that? At? Where does that happen, right? Stop, but stop putting funds through the traditional system and expecting something different to come out. And maybe, maybe, and it doesn't matter what your social economic status is. Putting funds directly in the hands of parents and allowing them to make decisions on behalf of their babies. I mean, that to me is the ideal way that doesn't allow things to get caught up in the system that we know already exists to do what it already does. I would absolutely agree with that. And I would say, I think that the way that we can hold each other accountable is to one, learn the history that we talked about before, understand the history, the barriers, um, the ways in which people have been marginalized and excluded from tables and from the system. You know, the system is fragmented. We know it's been fragmented for a a long, long time. COVID shine. It it really like cracked the cracked the nut all the way open to show that, you know, black and brown um, and indigenous individuals, people of color, have borne the brunt of these inequities for so many years and are finally using their voices in ways that they had not before. And people are starting to listen, but there's so much more, there's so much more that needs to be done. It is not, you know, Build Back Better to me was, you know, a way in which uh, to begin to hold people accountable and hold each other accountable for Mm -hmm. sure at various levels. And the fact that it didn't pass to me shouldn't stop us from continuing forward. But I think when we talk about this whole reimagining the system, when I hear about reimagining the system, it still sounds the same. And to Billy's (laughs) point, (laughs) we're going to do the same thing that we've done and just put a different title on it. That doesn't get to the change that we want to see. And so I think Mm -hmm. that hearing from, again, it's important for me to hear from communities who are impacted and learn from them and listen to them, really listen to them. And I think that for for providers and leaders who are at the grassroots level, um, at federal, state and local levels, like we need to build a new table. We need to tear that table down and build a whole new table because Mm -hmm. expecting people to come to tables that are already built, that already have, Mm -hmm. to Billy's point, these preconceived notions, it doesn't work for anybody. And it doesn't advance Mm -hmm. us forward and it doesn't change the system in the ways that we want to see the change. Mm -hmm. 
Can I add something to that, Cam? I mean, something came came Absolutely. to mind when you said that. You know, and I think we need to actually, as a country, assess: is the goal for every American citizen to thrive and live a good life? Right? Like that's really a question I have, because if the goal is that, then we need to stop creating policies that actually have barriers that are, don't allow people to thrive and have a good life. Uh, the, the one I'm going to use, and I think is, you know, so when my mom, my grandma, my great grandma, they came from the South. My mom was six, right? They lived in public housing. Now my mom has f- these friends from public housing that I had no clue were friends from public housing. And I'm going to share this because I think it's, it'll, it ties back to what is the intention. So I won't use, you know, Miss Rita and Miss Susie. I'm not going to use their real names, right? One one is a Irish woman and one is an Italian woman, right? Now, I always thought growing up that Miss Rita and Miss Susie were teachers because the majority of teachers in Connecticut, right, are white women. I always thought that. I don't know what made me ask one day as I got older, like, my, how do you, they're not, I mean, as I got older, I knew they weren't teachers. One had, you know, was a bus driver. One worked at the post office, right? So how do you know them? Like, and I've known them since birth. See, they, they grew up in the projects with me, right? And then asking myself, well, how is it that Miss Susie and Miss Rita were able to move on from public housing, own a home, and thrive, right? And I want to be clear, right? We as a country, we don't ever ask, I don't think we don't ask these questions. I mean, we know how, like, let me, look, I, look I'm a professor also, <laughs> so I know the research. I know why, right? I know why, because we didn't have access or we were denied access, right, to home loans for a very long time because of the color of our skin. So, so this question that I ask is, you know, all the things that we talk about as it pertains to equity, to me, is rooted in a question that I believe is still not publicly answered everywhere, specifically specifically by policymakers, because if our goal is for all Americans, right, to thrive and to have a thriving country, right, I think the policies that we come up with would have less barriers, Mm -hmm. right? Because it seems like we come up with policies and we say we want to address X, but up only if this, up only if that, up only if this. So, um, I want to add that because I think that's a question that should be at the forefront, especially of people of privilege and power and policymakers, right? What are the barriers that we're putting in place that don't allow this policy or allow all Americans to thrive? And listen, how do we remove those barriers? That was a great addition to what um, was said. Before we go, <laughs> it, time went by really fast. What mm. else would you like our listeners to know about your work? What do you wish that they knew? I think uh, for me, what I would say to all the listeners, because although I, I've done a lot of things in a lot of places, you don't have to be at the front to have impact. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, I don't, the only way you know me or get to know me as Kiami did is this, if you're in a room with me, I am not a uh, upfront need to be the face person. Because I believe there's power in helping people understand that you don't need to be upfront and be there to actually impact change. I think because that narrative, especially in our hyper social media society, normal everyday working people tend to believe if they're not in these roles, they don't know how to have impact. So what I would say to folks, uh, which you should know about me is I, when it, wherever I've been, I've been doing the work and no, I haven't always had to be up front and you don't either. Right. But we do need you to find whatever space you're in. Right. Learn more about it. Learn about how you can impact it Uh, because the change won't happen um, because a celebrity does a five minute interview about the ills of the world. Right. And I say that very much so because we do need, I want to be very clear because, like the civil rights movement was funded by a lot of our celebrities. I want to be like, that is not an opinion. It's history, it's facts. But what I'm saying is 
what they understood was we have access or they were resource adjacent because they were celebrities, but we're going to bring the resources to the people so the movement can continue. And I think what's happened in our history now is not only has the resources still been with celebrity folks or people who are resource adjacent, but they've also tried to take on like the lead. Someone in our office says this all the time. If you take a walk and you, you think you're leading and no one's behind you, then all you're doing is taking a walk. Right. So I want to encourage folks who are listening, whether you're in institutions, whether you're in classrooms, whether you're a child care provider, your you know, early child care, you can have impact wherever you are and you don't need to be the face. Because some people feel pressured by being the face so they don't say anything. And what I would encourage you is find a way to say something, right? In a way that you're comfortable with you can support the movement. Kiami? I would say that I would want all of you all to know from where I sit in my role is that there are some tremendous shifts that are taking place in philanthropy as it relates to racial equity and justice. That philanthropy is thinking deeply about how to invest more equitably in communities of color. They are, they have an interest in wanting to hear from individuals and communities that have been historically under-resourced. I do think that there's a lot more that needs to be done. I still think that there are so many in philanthropy that are in different spaces and places for various reasons. Mm -hmm that are not yet at a place where they are listening and hearing from community. And so part of my work is to move people along a continuum, that there's still much more learning to be done, but we can't always sit in a place of learning. And that's for everybody. That while you're learning, you also should act to Billy's point. And this is something that we are very much aligned in this, that, that it is important to both learn and act simultaneously. Because that is, I think that is the sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Part of what I am interested in doing in my role is to ensure that we shake the tables, mm-hmm. that um, we can no longer do what we've been doing because we see that that has not worked. And so I am very much pushing those who are members of ECFC to think differently. And I won't even say to think outside the box, to destroy the box and rebuild something that looks nothing like the box. Because what we've been trying to do, some things have worked though, Some, but a lot of things haven't. We keep talking about this idea of reimagining and transformation, and we have to make that look like something totally different. It can't be reimagining using the same old, same old, same old system. It has to be mm-hmm. something that includes voices who are, again, proximate to those things that are of uh, uh, challenges. We have to be thinking about strength-based approaches and not always thinking about communities of color from a deficit. Thinking about the way in which we are conducting and commissioning research in a more equitable and just way. As we think about equity, but we're not talking about justice as much as we should be. And I think that's where we're Absolutely. trying to go. And so that is that is really central to, to the work that we are trying to do and doing it in partnership with all of our members who are in philanthropy and do have the resources to really to change. Um, And so I'm excited about that and I'm I'm looking forward to working more closely with those in the community and those who are in philanthropy. What a great way to end this episode. Thank you both so much for joining me today. You can find today's episode and transcript on our website, teachdom.com slash impacting. And as always, behind great leading and teaching are powerful interactions. Let's build that culture together. Thanks again. How well do you know your biases and how they may be affecting your class observations? With class observation support reducing bias, you will dive into recognizing them and learning practical strategies for how to reduce them so you can feel more confident observing across diverse settings. This training is offered through live virtual facilitation with the Teach Stone class specialists, and we are proud to offer a flexible online on-demand training in January 2023. To learn more about class observation support reducing bias or other class observation supports, please visit teachstone.com.